This is the OGM community check-in call on Thursday, June 9th, 2022. Um, and Leif is zooming in from uh, a little town near Perpignan in France. So I'm waxing melodic about how cool that is. <laughs> yeah, it's quite remarkable. Uh, and I can tell you the story that on Monday, I will get fiber installed in my house. Seriously? Uh, yes, and it has only taken 15 years for France Telecom to Fine. deliver. Perfect. So you are you going to celebrate? <laughs> are you going to pop some, pop some champagne? Yes, of course. But here we drink Limou. Limou? Yes, mm. L-I-M-O-U-X. Which is what, Dave? It's the origin of uh, champagne. Ah. So the, uh, the monks from the area of Champagne came down to Limoux, which is close to Carcassonne, and learned the recipe. And then they went back and put a lot of IP rights around it and fences <laughs> and, and fortresses, et cetera. Um, yeah, so much history. Uh, and for those of you who just joined Pete, Stacey, uh, Leif is in the south of France near Perpignan. So we're talking about stuff that happens there. And, and one of my bucket list uh, items is actually to try to see some cave art in the Dordogne, somewhere in it there. And I, don't, and I don't know which of them are the most accessible, most reasonable. I am likely not a good caver. I think that uh, I, think that, uh, I would probably suffer being in an actual cave crawling through things where like what you're crawling through is only large enough for your head. That doesn't feel good to me <laughs> anymore, maybe as a kid. Uh, you but can still, crawl. Yeah, but I would still love to see the art. And, and what I don't understand, what I don't understand is the art that was made is way deep inside caves in an age when they didn't have flashlights and batteries. So they were clearly taking torches in or bonfires or making light somehow back then, yeah. unless they were, you know, unless they were raising bioluminescent critters and taking cups of light back, you know, back in there, which I don't, pretty sure that wasn't happening. Um, but it wouldn't have been a bad alternative, come to think of it, um, to, to do this art. And it's like, wow, how? And then you see the art. And it's yes. just shocking. My, my art history teacher at UC Irvine, who used to fly back and forth between Santa Barbara and Irvine for us, our Phil Leader, um, showed us the, you know, some artwork from the caves at Lascaux be before they had discovered Chauvet and all that. And he said, look, these people knew how to draw one hoof ahead of the other. Like perspective isn't this thing that suddenly gets invented later. We always knew how to draw naturalistically. There are religious and social reasons why we do this for 2000 years. And, and that just blew my mind way back then. I'm like, oh, okay, I, I can, I can get, get on with that program. Oh. Marvelous. Um, well, you know, Jerry, this is resonant with, um, with, um, what uh, Graeber and Winslow are doing in the dawn of everything. Of course. Uh, you know, a very different view of history and progress and the non-linearity of that and how much of what we do and know now, <coughs> we've been doing, known for, you know, tens of thousands of years on and off. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's, you know, it's we, been known. Humans are pretty inventive and we're pretty social and we figure things out when we don't kill each other off. At our... Uh public policy lab of the neighboring economics we thought it was going to be about just clever techniques or whatever zoning and things and it turned out the black folks came in and, and led by this one woman said look you know we don't want policy changes we want to uh, decolonize the economy because it was set up to you know enslave us and and exterminate us kevin you're breaking very up. good remark kevin that What's was that? very, very good. You're yeah, breaking thanks. Up, you're well, breaking they up were a little bit. Yeah, and so they're, they're continuing as a group of, of white folks and black folks doing it. And what's interesting is that the... Shoot. This one is getting good. The free. fact that they yeah. would be saying that to them and their group, but that the, the lead guy was meeting with J.P. Morgan the next day and he's going to say the same thing. And so like, th this is this role of the connected evangelist who tells the story to get in the room where those folks can't go and then opens the door. So he's a great example of you know, what in our taxonomy call the, the connected evangelist. 
I, I was uh, starting to tell uh, uh, that um, I've been waiting for 15 years to, for my for France Telecom to install uh, fiber in my house. Um, and uh, I usually, when I meet them in Paris, I ask them, how long does it take for nature to, to come up with a baby? And they say, nine months. How come that you need 15 years to fix this? Um, a small side note, uh, a long, many moons ago when I got out of grad school, uh, I had a project in Argentina uh, and the guy who was my main contact at this little engineering company in Argentina, Paolo Copertari, I think, um, had been waiting for a residential phone in Argentina for, I think, 13 years. Just a resident, regular residential phone in an apartment because the system was so screwed up and there was so much corruption. It was so awful. Um, and one of the suggestions I had during our project was for them to call up MCI and Ericsson and just build a cellular system in Buenos Aires uh, and then connect it to and later first pick off the people for whom that was a high value item they would pay a lot for service and then connect it to the phone system etc they never did that but five years later their main competitors were the main utility helping the emergent new cell phone carriers that were Telefonica and Bell South had come in and split the city <clears throat> I think anyway um Kevin, do you want to kick us off today? And then Eric, you had uh, we we missed you last time. You had some screen sharing you want to do, so let's go, um, Kevin, <coughs> Eric, Leif for starters. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, well, you know, I'm moving into this new phase of not being in operations, and there's younger people coming into our business, uh, and, and and but we're staying engaged. And so, you know, I'm uh, my new role is. Uh, ambassador scout reporter kind of thing and then i bring it back to them and they decide if it fits in or where it fits in or whatever so you're Which like, 10, kind of you're like 10, what 10. I've done, but now I'm, I'm not even pretending to be in operations or 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 to try to build something i'm just like connecting it to them and so it's it's a pretty interesting role um and you know and then i can be building new things as long as they're outside of our core, because and, and the, our business has grown to the point where it has, we know what we have a replicable model that'll work, right? And so when things get replicable, I gotta go find something new to do, and so I I can build things outside of our business that can connect to it, like some marketplaces and things. So anyway, it's it's a pretty interesting role, uh, you know. I'm, I I like it when I can exile myself from operations in the business and go figure out something else. So, good to know that about yourself yeah yeah a lot of times you stay around and, and you just tinker and then you don't have the patience you used to do and you know but you have too much social capital they let you start off and do stupid things what um along this process what light bulbs have sort of lit up in your head what what different kinds of insights uh showed up for this set of projects well you know i've had to learn to follow you know uh I think if you see a 70 year old do good or white guy leading the project, then that's wrong. You know, I've found, uh, uh, you know, women of color who's, who I am following, you know, Stephanie Swepson Twitty and, in uh, in, 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 in the funds we're doing and stuff. And so I go out and do my sort of scout thing for her. And we're building something, but I, you know, I, I, I think it's time for you know boomers to step back and guys to learn to follow as opposed to lead. Because we're all, people, you know, you're always told you can be a leader. You know, I think you know, boomer boomer guys who want to help need to learn to follow and listen to what's already happening out there. Thanks, Kevin. Um, let's go, Eric, Leif, uh, Doug, Carmichael, and Eric. Hey, I think has a show and tell. Yeah, um, I made a video about it, but I'm going to show some few things. Thanks. So first of all, it's good to see you, Doug um, Breitbart. Uh, yeah, and thanks for the book you helped write. Um, so, um, so I'm uh, I'm thinking about the meaning of life lately, <laughs> and uh, well, yeah, why not? Um, I tweeted a few things about it, and there's actually a Twitter bot that uh, looks for those tweets. And this is what it came up with. 
uh, based on something I tweeted. It said, machine language is to be happy. It's truly all the matters in the grand scheme of it. Hmm. Okay, so words of wisdom there. I'll post a bunch of links when I'm done, but um, this is uh, what I wanted to show. Uh, Sinclair ZX81. And uh, the video I made is a kit. Now, if you think about Clive Sinclair, the first computer he created, he wanted a real low cost machine for the masses and, and, and UK uh, where he lived, uh, they um, really marketed it. And uh, this is a six inches square and uh, for uh, under a hundred pounds, the people were able to get the machine and learn it and program on it. And those people are doing the cryptography these days and all kinds of interesting work because they were able to learn on a machine that was slow enough to uh, learn on. And, um, and what I realized, um, there were two women who wrote a book to really introduce, a series of books uh, who re to really introduce people on how to use the machine. So you have the genius who builds it and the people who support the whole thing. So I'm, I'm having fun with this. Um, so like uh, the software came on cassettes and I was able to load one of these cassettes. And then I realized uh, there's machine code in it. So I was able to print out the machine code, go through the numbers and figure out the machine instructions. So, um, yeah, and then I got a game of life working on it. So that's also the meaning of life. But what I'm thinking more, I'm feeling a calling more towards music. And I got a bunch of DVDs I'm just going to show. Because um, looking back towards the early part of the 20th century and how technology influenced the music and film industry. So Irving Berlin, um, he, he has a fascinating life. Of um, and the st the songs are linked to him, uh, his moments in his life, like Blue Skies is when he had his uh, child. Um, Al Jolson's story, I watched that recently. Um, that has some yes connection for me as a Jew. Um, so then uh, related to that is George Gershwin and a whole bunch of like American songbook things. Uh, and then film, uh, Charlie Chaplin, the silent film era. Yeah, so Jolson was the first talking picture, the, the first time people saw, boy, heard voices while watching a movie. So before that, it was all piano music and orchestras providing the background and you'd read subtitles on the screen. And then uh, getting into American music, the American roots music, um, a whole bunch, a whole history, uh, also this American epic when, so yeah, there's the whole New Orleans and all, all these forces coming together. So I guess what I'm trying to see is uh, there's something I need to learn going back and looking at the stuff, something related to uh, just the impact of technology on life. And there's a few more like Miles Davis making jazz popular, um, Les Paul engineering, and then world music. Uh, Kitaro is a Japanese synthesizer composer and uh, Yanni. So, so I just put the selection of things to study in further depth as I figure out what music means to me and my style, where I want to go with it. So that's my meaning of life for now. <laughs> so thanks. I'm going to post the links. Uh, Eric, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, have you seen the video explaining Coltrane's giant steps? I'd love to see that. Uh, I just pasted it, the, oh, the link Thank to you. the video in the yes. chat. Uh, and mm -hmm. giant steps is sort of music theory played out mm -hmm. as, a, as a song, yep, uh, which has been covered by lots and lots of people. Uh, mm -hmm. Super interesting. And I know zippity duda about music theory. So the video is fascinating, fascinating to cool. me. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, I remember seeing that for the first time, the chords jumping all over the place. Yeah, it's great. And there's, there's a diagram where he's oh, wow. making, making his way yeah. around. He drew it out. He oh, drew wow. it out cool. in, in this visual way that's super cool. Nice. Um, Pete, Pete, your life sort of bridges music and computing and history and all that kind of stuff. Do you want to jump in for a moment? 
Um, thanks for the invitation. I, I, I would probably have to prep better. Uh, one thing that, that comes up for me is um, uh, Aaron Copeland did an interesting thing with American music um, uh, and uh, collected American folk songs. And one of them is uh, originally known as Napoleon's Retreat. Um, and uh, it's really interesting. I, I found a recording, I think, on YouTube of um, the, a, a fiddler, you know, back in the Appalachia in the, I don't know, uh, early 1900s playing um, uh, Napoleon's Retreat. I'll, I'll share that. that that's a, a cool kind of little history thing. Um, it turned into the, I think it's the, the American Beef Council or whatever, ended up using <laughs> that, that song for um you know the, so you'll recognize the tune um and it's weird knowing that it came out of uh, appalachia and i and i think it has nothing to do with napoleon uh, is another interesting kind of so it's, it's fun it's eric it's uh, digging retreat. back into what's that it's bonaparte's retreat uh but it has nothing to do with napoleon apparently yeah, but, but i think the tune is called bonaparte's Re retreat. it is yeah yeah, yeah. and you can hear the fiddler he's fiddling along and you say this is the bony part and he's fiddling <laughs> like yeah that's okay, awesome cool. yeah, oh I, maybe maybe while i've got the um i i ended up ordering this online i used to work with microprocessors See, so this do is have visual whole, aids this is a whole computer um nice. you know of the kind i think it's close to an insight uh, 6800 which is uh, you know it was a big boxy thing like this on the cover of popular electronics back in the late 70s yeah, old so, computers are really popular lately. Yeah, <laughs> um, so one thing I wanted to follow up. Um, so I just forgot it. <laughs> I'll come back. I'll just go ahead. Sure, and I'll, I'll go to Stu in a sec. Uh, there's also the Vintage Computer Federation, which is mm -hmm. for anybody who cares about this stuff, uh, apparently the American place to go for comparing notes and swapping things. They have face-to-face -face meets, uh, a whole bunch of stuff like that. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Stuart, and then Julian. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, that you evoking Kataro mm -hmm. reminded me of a performance I saw of his in Philadelphia in the, in the mid 80s. There were two large kettle drums suspended on the stage from the ceiling with the face of the drum facing the audience. And I couldn't imagine why. I thought they were just, you know, ornaments. And then the last part of the performance, he was um, bare chested back to the audience, uh, hair down to his waist, playing the two kettle drums. Mm. It was the most extraordinary tribal experience that, that, that I've had in a concert. It was just absolutely amazing. So thank you for Eric for- sure. That's great that. to hear. There was a Japanese musical group, I think named Kodo that played Kodo drums. I went to their performance once in Los Angeles many, many moons ago, it was beautiful. Yeah, and <clears throat> there was a professor at Delaware who had um, a gamelan band with the students, the Javanese um, gongs. And uh, what, I, I, what I was remembering was um, the power of music therapy, you know, um, just uh, in these times, just to help people. I know that there are some people really exploring that. Okay, and then Julian? Uh, Eric, you just said old uh, computers are getting popular again. So actually, this is a general invitation. Anybody who thinks that can come get a bunch, there's a whole pile of them out in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Seriously. Um, uh, so the uh, uh, remark from France, <laughs> you know what the, the uh, French word for computer is? Ordinateur. Oh, yeah, or, ordinateur. Yes, exactly. Uh, and it's a big difference between an ordination and uh, ordering numbers and a computer. And the uh, Chinese word for computer is electric mind. Yeah, so think about what we had in the 80s, all this new stuff coming out and people knowing nothing, learning how to use it and build their own things with it. So it was a fascinating time. And how can we get back to that excitement? Well, I would like to go forward rather than yeah. going back. And, and yeah. uh, going forward is related to where we started off in uh, talking about uh, the roles of um, the future. In Sweden right now, there's a tremendous demand for leadership issues. And um, 
I wonder if you have some remarks on why is leadership so uh, popular right now? Is it that people don't have a navigator or that they are lost in navigation or translation? Or what is it uh, that is demanding this uh, leadership when it should probably be that uh, we learn from the 10 year old uh, kids uh, how to play the music or play the game or uh, shape new connections. Yeah, I think that's emergent asking? leadership. I think, I think that's important to watch for emergent leaders. Yes, but is it the tiny, uh, 10 year old guys or is it uh, some other generational dimension to it? Well, I think that our we're in, you know we're in the middle of five crises probably has a little something to do with it that we're we're I think there's a leadership crisis, and it could well be that old forms of leadership got us into these five crises because they've been failing, which explains a lot of wrestling and very good point and anxiety good point. about politics and government that's happening worldwide. And I think that the topic that keeps burbling up in our conversations is this emergent leadership theme. What can we learn from indigenous people? What can we learn from children? How does this decentralize and federate? Pete, feel free to jump in, <clears throat> um, in you know, uh, into new forms of leadership that I think is what we're going to end up with. So 100 years from now, I think we'll look back and go, man, glad we made it through that little squeezy, horrible point and you know, saved humanity because now life is better because we are more represented, we, more people's voices are heard, we're not trampling on everybody's rights, and we found some new forms of governance. And if we, if we can pull all that stuff off, I'll be like really happy. Are we <clears throat> really hearing the voices or is it that it's still a lot of noise in, in the hearing? Um, Julian, did you wanna add more? Yeah, I had another uh, follow up from what Eric was saying, so please. Um, you mentioned Chaplin, and a couple of weeks ago, I, I made the kids take me to my old childhood haunts for my birthday and discovered the SNA Film Museum. So the Niles District of Fremont was the original Hollywood. This is where they did all the, their movies before uh, Chaplin decided that Niles was too way back. I mean, it really was remote, and, and he wanted a bigger city, and then they moved to Hollywood. So the SNA Film Museum was uh, created by the descendants of the SNA Film Studios. SNA was the initials of the original guys. S, I forgot what S stands for. A was for Anderson. And eventually around 1914 or so, they had a falling out and split apart. And A went on to become Bronco Billy Anderson. So uh, he and Chaplin and uh, Keaton, they were all shooting their movies there in this backwoods. And then uh, there's a few remnants of it. If you're ever in Niles or in Fremont, California, take an hour and go see this museum. It was fascinating to, to see all of this stuff from now 100 years ago. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Carl? One, oh, sorry, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, one more comment. <clears throat> um, yeah. I could watch all these DVDs by myself, but it would be nice if people are interested in specific ones, let me know and we could try to do a watch party. Um, so I'm gonna rename at per, per Pete's suggestion. I just haven't gotten to it and wrote, realizing it now, <clears throat> I'll rename our calls channel to uh, OGM Town Square so that we're sort of in parallel with the other communities that are using the Mattermost chat server. And, if, uh, and Eric, if you just want to say, sort of post the time and say, watch party, mm -hmm. uh, here's here's the thing, here's the time and see, if, see who shows up or just ask for a time or whatever, please do. Um, I think that'd be great fun. Yeah, thanks. Um, super, Carl. Uh. During the topic, I went and got my OQO t-shirt. You probably have a thought on that, but yeah, this was a little little computer, Jory Bell, who was um, designed a G4 um, um, series. I got one of those too, so if anybody wants it, it's got a whopping 40 gig hard drive. Um, <laughs> and, Which was big back in the day. Yeah, I got the, I was, they told me I was the first person in the Washington DC area to buy one of these. And uh, it also got me um, my, my um, cheers here uh, at the time they had a annual, they had an annual anniversary party and the, the manager always gave out awards. We had that big blackout, I think that was like 2003 or so, but like the whole, like, 
major part of the East Coast. So I, he gave me a most impacted by a blackout award. Nice. <laughs> and stuff. So that's my old technology thing. Including, yeah. Well, I'm also probably the only person who's still using one, two, three for Windows. You may well be. <laughs> I've used you it for well DOS. Yeah. Um, Try four. <laughs> Quattro. <yeah. laughs> um, to wrap up. Um, so, yeah, just thinking about how the computer industry evolved during our lifetimes. And uh, like, I, I wasn't familiar with an OQO computer, but as I study, that there are just so many different brands that emerged all over the place and really started back in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, like once the idea came around the world, everybody built their own thing. And then, but now we have an Apple have their worldwide developer conference. And then the EU has a regulation now to uh, regulate the charging technology. So Apple's lightning is uh, gonna eventually go away. But So look what, where we are now and uh, how we got there. So can we get back to that spurt, that Cambrian explosion time? Just a thought, thanks. Good question. It brings me to, uh, uh, thought from earlier conversation here. Um, how does this role question uh, uh, link up or bridge with the theory of agents? Could it be that the theory of agents is much more relevant for the future than the, the management theories at, from our universities? Can you say something about the theory of agents for those of us who are not familiar with it? Well, it, it's about the relationship between uh, nodes and uh, characterized by people as well as machines and uh, other um, capabilities and, and how you connect to uh, play different roles um, in either a company or in a uh, music performance or film. Um, and that is not uh, limiting your capabilities. It's rather the opposite. So therefore, you can actually have a number of roles that you play during a daytime. Um, and in the old industrial society, we had a limited number of roles we play. But with the, the new IT society, we can play hundreds of roles during a daytime. And that, of course, changes uh, uh, what uh, we said earlier. I think it was Jerry who said uh, to get our voices heard. Uh, and I think that is a very interesting democratical issue. Is your voice heard? Would you have to put on yellow vests or other kind of items to be able to be seen and heard? But that is just the first step. You have to have a number of other steps to get forward after being heard. And that might be called the democracy. It might be called other things. And therefore, the society, as we said, is probably at the kind of um, uh, fog right now in leadership. Who takes the lead in a society? The one who is screaming highest. So, um, I forgot I was going to go ahead, Julian. Going back to what Leif and Eric were just talking about, and from what Leif just said, I think it's related to, but to the comment about Eric, which is that uh, if you look back in the very early 1900s, there were dozens, if not hundreds, of different car manufacturing companies, and it's been whittled down to just a few dozen now. A few decades later, the same thing happened with airplanes. It's like the 1930s was the most widely, uh, the biggest design era for airplanes. And since then, the designs have been whittled down to just a few. And if you look at computers, now I think we've gotten to the same point where personal computers, there were just dozens back in the 70s and 80s. And now it's been whittled down to what the big manufacturers do. It seems like there's this iterative process where everybody goes crazy at the beginning of, of the, the technology. And then it gets, starts getting whittled down as there's more experience about how things 
um, how to design things and how they, they work in their actual lifetimes. So I'm wondering, um, given the advent of even newer technologies, I think we'll be going through the same things. I was at the Augmented World Expo last week, and I see now that there's this explosion of companies in different markets where there was only a couple just a few years ago. And I think we'll see the same process of whittling down. It seems to be necessary that uh, when a subject comes along, everybody tries experimenting with all different ways. And as you get a level of experience, then it, it starts to filter down to what works best. And um, Julian, there's a really interesting history here in American business. There's a reason the companies are called General Motors and United Airlines is that they were roll-ups. Yeah. Um, there were basically lots and lots of little players that got rolled up into one big company, either through a series of acquisitions or in at ts case, through the granting of a, of a, of a nationwide monopoly on, on telecom uh, to, to get rid of the fact that people used to have like a dozen phones on their desk depending on which company their trading partner was with, they might pick up a different phone and make a different call through a different system. So we needed to somehow get through that. Uh, the, the history is complicated, but but like general, mo it's like really interesting. Um, yeah, there were lots, there were lots there. of big roll-ups. Pardon like me? General Motors Chrysler, because Chrysler was the original company that got swallowed. Right. Um, cool. Uh, we have Leif, Stacy, and... Doug Carmichael in the queue. Leif, did you want to add something there as, a, as by we, means yes. of check-in? Yes, I think General Motors is a very interesting uh, label for standardization of uh, management. Um, today we have the ISO that is emerging, ISO for innovation even. Um, and um, my kind of... Um, quest here is, could it be that the standardization like General Motors is um, locking up that spirit that we were searching for uh, uh, 50 minutes ago, actually, that the uh, we are trying to ordain, organize and over-organize that it goes into the bureaucracy of yesterday. A little thought. <laughs> Thanks, Leif. Um, Stacy, you've made your way back to the floor. The floor is yours. My, I'm passing you the mic. So the, I the, wanted... la the laser beams are on. They're flashing behind you. <laughs> if I could connect everything now. <laughs> the, the, the pot, the pot of ice, uh, dry ice, is now boiling over. Go. So I wanted to throw <laughs> down a virtual speed bump from when Eric talked about happiness being the meaning of life, and just throw out that most people really don't know what how to get happiness. They're confused about what will bring them happiness. And, um, but ultimately they wanna feel like they mattered. And I wanted to connect that to when Kevin was talking about learning how to follow and then connect that to the idea of that 10 year old leader. That 10 year old leader is not looking to make a name for himself. That 10 year old leader is acting authentically into what he wants to do. And it resonates with the other people that are following him. He's not looking to make a mark. He is being authentic. Um, and I think that when we think about all these new things being created, we, we should maybe recognize why we're always looking for the next bigger and better thing. And that's it. <laughs> that's all I wanted to say. Just something to think about. <laughs> um, just the narratives about what we're aiming for and what our goals are, are, are part of larger narratives that people are busy selling us. So the whole, the whole notion that companies must grow, that the economy must grow or we will all die is a narrative that we sort of bought into. Uh, that's being fought unsuccessfully by by other groups like the degrowth people and and so on and so forth. And uh, Leif, you were about to jump in and say something. Yeah, I, I, just Stacey, one more thing. I was re really interested in what Leif was saying about um, I don't I don't remember what you called it an agent model. That sounded really promising. Yeah, and uh, it also relates to what we just touched upon that uh, the curiosity 
might be related to what in other circumstances is called uh, visionary values. And then uh, we know from research that visionary values bring happiness. Uh, and if you lose the visionary values, you tend to return back to a kind of very meaning making or mean making um, situation. So therefore the joy of tomorrow is actually in the visionary values. And it might be that the 10 year old has a kind of in, uh, natural way of uh, fulfilling that visionary uh, navigation, what, which we might lose later on, especially when we go into General Motors model of leadership. Mm -hmm. I, I think kids' voices in these contexts are really interesting. In one sense, they just don't have a lot of history or context. So they don't have like a rich understanding of what's going on and how things work. On the other hand, they usually ask like the really blunt question, like, why do we do this? <clears throat> like, like really, mm -hmm. why is this happening? And, and one of our nieces at age seven asked her parents, like, why are there homeless people on the street? and made the local news in Denver years ago. And uh, they, they started bagging up food to drop off with homeless people and things like that. It was just, a, it was a simple, obvious question. It's like, why, why in our society are there people who don't have something? There seems to be a lot of stuff. Um, and there's, so, so I think one of, kids, one of kids' superpowers is seeing what maybe ought to be and asking why it, why it ain't. Um, and we should pay more attention to those kinds of things because they're, I think they're getting, they're, seeing they're intuiting the natural flow or state of how things could be and then looking at things going well why not and and another thing for me is that our various socialization processes which vary dramatically by culture squeeze this natural skill out of us and so socialization basically drains us of creativity and diversity and uh, a whole bunch of other kinds of things and then locks us into a belief system that is coherent with our culture which helps us exist within that culture, but makes it really hard for us to see stuff outside the culture and, and see different ways. Socialization is really, really, really strong. Why is, is that why you really call strong? your uh, email associate? I called myself associate in 98 because I like to associate people and ideas. And because I think that the social changes we're going through will be more profound than the economic and structural changes we've already seen because of things like e-commerce and the intertubes. And so I, I've, always, I've always felt like I was, a, when I was a tech industry analyst, I always felt like I was a champion for humans uh, and that I was kind of lonely in that, that everybody else was like looking for what's going to make a lot of money. How do we suck data out of people, uh, whatever, whatever. And I was like, yeah, but humans. Um, yeah. Good. Very good. And it also links to what we said earlier that uh, associate it might be uh, an agent role or an agency role. Yes. And and Leif, if you have any links to add to the chat, because <clears throat> I don't think you mean agency theory, which is a different thing altogether. And so theory of actors or theory of agents, I looked around, I didn't find very much. But if you can find an article or a post or whatever to share with us, that'd be great. Yes, I will. Uh, it has been researched uh, by some <clears throat> colleagues at University of Lund. So I will uh, put that into uh, the chat. Thank you. Um, I'm haven't... sitting with my mobile right now, so I don't have the possibility I... to check around. <clears throat> that was my assumption. Although I know a couple of people who are astonishing with just their phones. Like they manage, they manage to juggle post and do a whole bunch of crazy stuff with phones, which I am not able to do. It's beyond my ability as well. Um, let's go uh, Doug Carmichael, Wendy Stewart. Uh, okay, so I have a question that's been bothering me all week. And the question is, is it impossible to do a startup without creating CO2? Uh, start with the commuting of workers, uh, add the energy that goes into computing. Uh, it just seems to me that there's actually no way to do a startup which isn't contributing to CO2. That's a question. So is it possible to act, to move around during the day and not create CO2 other than just taking a walk in the park? Uh, so forget startups. Bicycles. 
Yeah. Well, okay. so so we funded one that was uh, carbon negative, uh, alter eco, uh, organic, uh, regenerative farming around it. The, uh, the groundwater around uh, quinoa production was improved. And, uh, you know, and so with insets, not offsets, you know, mm -hmm. offsets means you can buy trees in, in Brazil. The insets meant that they improved the ecosystem around commercial farming. And, you know, the product is carbon negative. And actually the, uh, their uh, truffles are biodegradable. And they've formed a collaborative with a bunch of other food companies around what part of the, the stuff that they build together, like packaging, can be in the commons. Cool. And, and a startup, um, Doug, does a startup that is carbon negative intentionally by its design and action qualify for you? Well, I want to do a really accurate analysis. So a carbon negative uh, company is still probably doing computing uh, that takes energy. Uh, they're in a building. It took energy to build that building. If they're doing any transportation, it's using energy. Uh, if you take something like uh, wind turbines, okay, so it's creating clean energy. But the amount of carbon that went into producing that wind turbine is huge if you add up across the whole cycle. And of course, part of the problem is that nature adds, adds up across the whole cycle you can't avoid it um gil do you want to jump in and explain the eroi yeah doug i think you're talking about energy return on investment or maybe it's carbon return on investment which is what's the investment you got to put into the new thing which you know will, like you say will have an impact uh, and what benefit does that generate um, like a you know like an investment of money has to generate return on investment does an energy investment in a new technology produce net beneficial Results. I think that's the question you're asking, and it's a good question. It's not often asked. I mean, you know, in a lot of cases, well, for example, you know, keeping your old car may make more sense than buying the new, you know, zero emissions electric vehicle because of the embodied energy that it takes in the steel and the rubber and the electronics and so forth. So it's a great question. It's rarely asked. Uh, it's it, it ties in with the degrowth story in really complicated ways. And maybe the best resource to get really, you know, analytically precise on this, Doug, is is uh, Saul Griffith, um, the MacArthur Fellow, operates oh, Saul Griffith in San Francisco. Yeah, huh? Saul. You, I'm you sorry, wrote Scott. Type, uh, I thought yeah. you meant. Yeah, good. I did mean Saul. Other labs in San Francisco, and he's done some of the most uh, geeky, you know, multi decimal point analysis of some of the stuff. So I would yes. start there if I were you. Yes. Saul Let me add cool. another dimension to it that's been puzzling me. And that is, if you create a new startup, that startup is creating relations with people. Relations tend to stabilize society, which in this case means it makes it harder to change. So are you saying that healthy relations or relationships actually preserve the status quo? Is that your claim here? Exactly. I'm not sure I agree with that. I well, think also relationships are how change happens. I think it's like, <laughs> both, both sides. When you create a relationship that uh, it gets defended, uh, people want to hold on to their relationships. And that's part of the fabric that keeps society stable. But that's trouble when we need to change desperately. So, Doug, if I take your arguments and run them out a little ways, I hear you saying we should not start any more companies and we should stop having relationships. I don't think that's what you mean to say. Well, I'm not positive. Uh, I think that if we go I think that might a, be what you're trying to say then. In the cascading series of collapses, uh, those collapses undo relationships. And that allows reconfiguration. To the extent that we hold on, it makes reconfiguration difficult. So have you just become a millenarian? Are you like looking for the rap the collapse and the rapture so that we can just reorganize stuff? Are you going to go join Saul? I'm uh, sorry, uh, Steve Bannon's new school. <laughs> I just want us to be honest about the implications of what we're doing. Well, I think I think uh, I, I'll speak for everybody, and then everybody can chime in. I think we're generally believing that we have to expend energy in order to fix stuff, and that's just a cost of trying to fix stuff. 
And if we can be really intelligent about it, then the energy we, we expend will be neutralized and offset and maybe even uh, go negative because how we do what we do, in fact, compensates for the energy expended in doing so. And that's just a, that's just a rationalization we're making. And Pete has something to say about that. Uh, thanks, Jerry. And thanks, Doug. Uh, uh, it's a good question. Um, one of the things to remember is I like you, 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 I, at some point you might want to walk up the chain and say, why are we trying to be zero carbon or carbon neutral or whatever? Um, why are we trying to limit the energy we expend so that we don't create carbon? Um, the, the whole carbon thing is, uh, results in climate change. Um, so I'm going to say something that sounds crazy, but I don't mean it in a crazy way. So, um, give me, give me some room here. Um, uh, it's, it's not necessarily that we have to avoid climate change. It's just that climate change has a bunch of bad effects. So another, another strategy would say, uh, a strategy similar to the letter rip um, strategy of, of uh, COVID mitigation um, is to say, yeah, screw it. Um, climate change is gonna happen. I don't care if you know, the global warming goes to two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, whatever shit happens, um, you know, uh, it's going to be more chaos um, and we'll deal with the chaos. So I, you know, the, I, I think it's a good thing to kind of put a, a flag in the ground, a, a plant of plant a flag and say, let's try to keep it to 1.5 degrees or two degrees. Um, my, my other observation is I don't think we will right? Just structurally, um, and we're going to slide past the one and a half, we're going to slide past the two, we're going to get to two and a half, we might go to three, we might go to six, you know, it's one of the, the, the other effect is um, the, the chaotic effects of where we get to changes every time we get a little bit closer to, you know, two degrees or two and a half degrees. So, when when we're at 1.5 degrees, we can say, well, if we slide over a little bit, we'll go to three, but then we'll be okay, or we'll be as okay as it will be more okay than we we were at six. If we get to two and a half or three, all hell breaks loose. We don't know what's going to happen, right? It might go to six quickly. It it might not. Everybody might die. All the biosphere might die. I don't know. You know, so um, I there there's kind of two paths. I see us worrying a lot about carbon and I think that's really, really important. And you kind of also want to place that in the context of, you know, we're going to overshoot where we want to get to anyway. Um, and I don't, I, I'm not saying that we should let it rip and just do whatever we want, but, um, you know, you, you kind of need to, I, I, I try to keep two goals in mind. Let's try to reduce carbon as much as we can. Let's try to keep, you know, climate change in check. Let's try, and when I, when I say climate change in check, what I'm saying is let's reduce the chaos essentially, right? But let's, but, you know, I, there's a, it's, it's more complicated than that. You're actually balancing, um, uh, you're not just trying to keep the, the temperature low, you're balancing uh, the inputs and effects of what we do now, including burning energy and, and trying to end up in a place. I, I guess actually another thing I always wonder about is who's trying to do what, right? Are we trying to um, reduce the amount of global suffering? Are we trying to reduce the amount of suffering for the 1%? Are we trying to reduce the suffering for the 0.1%? Um, we don't, I feel like we don't talk about that enough um, because, because the, the hell that the climate scientists can see is so bad, you kind of have to like reduce the whole thing, which the real goal is reducing chaos and suffering. It's not reducing temperature, right? You have to reduce all of that messaging and all of that complicated philosophical existential crap into like, okay, I'll tell you what, <laughs> 
the top line thing is if we can just like reduce carbon, it's probably going to be a lot better, right? And then, and then that's a goal that people can kind of organize around and keep in their head and go, you know, uh, you know, so many parts per million, so many parts per million. Um, I just saw somebody on Twitter say, guys, it's time, you know, uh, we've been calling it 1.5. Um, it's time to say that we're at 1.6 degrees, right? Um, and and, he, and the what he said is mm -hmm. every little partial degree makes a lot of, a lot of, it, it's important to think about that, right? As, as we cross these barriers from 1.5 to 1.6 saying that, okay, well, it looks like we slipped and now we're at 1.6 is a lot different than saying we've been holding at 1.5 for however many years. The, but there's, it, for maybe for some of us in this room, I think there's messaging where you want to say, let's hold the line on carbon. There's a lot of other philosophical, philosophical and existential stuff that at least I worry about, you know, what happens when we get to two and a half degrees and, and all hell is breaking loose. So I'm trying to hold the line and I'm also like considering, you know, so Doug's question I think is a really good one. Um, and it's a focusing thing and it's like, you know, carbon is one of the most important things and we should focus on that. And still, you know, um, if we can spend energy now that creates carbon now that makes a softer landing in 40 years or 50 years or whatever, that's, you know, that's another conversation that, that we ought to be able to have. Um, it's a higher level conversation. It gets more complicated. It's, uh, you know, it, it doubles down or triples down or quadruples or, or squares or, or something. It's an exponential growth and kind of the existential, you know, mindset that you have to be holding. Um, you know, it's, uh, like those weird discussions about seatbelts and stuff like that, you know, how many people is it okay that drown and don't have food, you know, at two and a half degrees. Um, but I think, I think it's incumbent on us at this time to be thinking in both modes, right? The simple mode and the really complex mode. It's like going to get more complicated and more complicated. And the answer to the more complicated stuff the 80% answer is reducing carbon. The other 20% is a lot more complicated than that, right? How can we, how can we re, uh, so I guess the thing I work on is how can we re-engineer society so that it works differently, so that we have a more sustainable way of doing society at large in a hundred years. And that's, you know, and, and, I don't worry too much about the carbon impact of that because I think the, the, the having a soft landing for society in a hundred years is also important. Right. And so as long as I'm not like blowing the carbon budget, I don't worry about that. I'm, I'm like, okay, we're going to do use computing and networking and stuff like that, which is not carbon negative. And, and thank God there are people working on zero carbon and carbon neutral computing and stuff like that. But, you know, it's a complicated thing. Uh, out there a hundred years from now. It's not just carbon. Thanks. Um, Pete, <clears throat> if I can just riff on what you said uh, in one direction, which is um, if I were a realist looking out the window, I'd be like, wow, the danger that scares me the most is that we kill off all life in the oceans. So let's figure out what it takes to preserve life in the oceans. And then I'm assuming temperatures are going to just keep rising, waters are going to keep melting, et cetera, et cetera. So let's figure out how to live on the oceans with some form of natural cooling that keeps us from dying a wet bulb heat death <clears throat> and growing food and everything else. And so I would focus a whole bunch of energies on those two goals. I'm just making this up. Um, is, that, is that an appropriate strategy given what you just said? And is that something like what the deep adaptation folks are saying or are they saying something completely different? Um, darn good questions. And right away, my first reaction is, oh my God, he's talking about uh, adaptation rather than mitigation. You know, it scares the hell out of me to talk about that way because it, when you talk about it, people hear, oh, you mean it's okay. So we're going to go the adaption route. We're going to do the letter rip thing. Um, oh, okay. So I'm just going to go to parties and whatever without my mask. Oh, I'm just going to fire up my coal burning uh, pickup truck and, and spew black smoke because it doesn't matter anymore because we're adapting that scares the hell out of me when, you know, even talking about it, I, I try not to even think about adaptation. We have just taken you there. 
<laughs> um, and so your questions are good ones, Jerry. I'm actually not a, a, an expert on any of the adaptation stuff. And um, and like I said, it freaks the the heck out of me that that when I I guess I guess I I know that there are people thinking about deep adaptation or think people thinking about uh, living on the ocean and just making sure the oceans are okay and we don't die of wet bulb heat death. Um, and it's like, oh my gosh, are they like on the on the evil side where they're just going let her rip, or are they are they actually working really hard on mitigation and reducing the effects of climate change? And they've also got some contingency plans for, you know, for stuff. I so I don't know. It's a thanks for the question. I I don't know the answers because I'm not an expert at that. Um, and it's a good illustration for me of how like freaky hard it is to talk about, you know, the 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 10% or 20% kind of stuff we should be thinking about, but um, but you want to make sure that thinking about that and talking about that doesn't infect the all, all of society with the idea that that um, carbon isn't important. Before going on with the conversation, I just want to note how complicated this is for us who have the privilege to sit here and have these conversations, who have some resources, who are calm in the face of what's going on still notably, uh, maybe those who aren't are the ones who are not joining us on the calls, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, but this is not easy, none of it. And there are conflicting opinions, plenty, uh, of what to do and how to go about doing it. And we're trying to figure out, I think we have a shared goal yeah. of, hey, we need to act together in order to solve things. And Doug says we need like some some, some sort of centralized mandate and we need to stop doing all the crap that, that is harming us right this second. And, and top down is, a, is an answer to that. And we're also talking about emergent strategies and mob strategies and who knows what, uh, but this is really hard. Um, and Doug was talking about that we need to organize for it. To me, it sounded like uh, we are then searching for the general motors for the climate. Possibly. Is I that mean, correct? Mr. Carmichael, is that a good analogy? Well, I think that, uh, am I unmuted? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm on a farm outside of Sacramento, so I've got Sweet. lots of weird background noises. Um, uh, I just don't know the answer. But the question might open uh, the idea that, as we know, General Motors is one tentative solution. Uh, we have also, also have Toyota that uh, grow up into another uh, paradigm with their work than the Well, General I think Motors. you're impl implying something like the response of uh, the US to World War II and shifting General Motors from cars to planes and tanks. Uh, the problem now is a larger scale. And even if we had a central organization, we don't know what they should do to cut CO2 because any cutting of CO2 is going to unemploy somebody somewhere. So Doug, and nobody wants to go there. Yeah, Doug, I'm not sure that Leif is pointing to the mobilization, the World War II mobilization. I think he's pointing to uh, corporate roll-ups that might actually be helpful here in some way. And I, I'm sort of noting that Toyota gifted the world the Toyota production system, TPS, which affected a whole lot of people in a whole lot of places and arguably led to just-in-time inventory, which made systems fragile, but arguably gave workers autonomy because anybody could stop the, the assembly line and arguably created second and third uh, triple loop learning systems inside of organizations so that they could learn from their mistakes and, and fix stuff. And so maybe, I'm just, I'm just guessing here, maybe there's a consortium of, consortium of global businesses that can say, screw us being the, like the, the bad guys here. We're going to get together and create the next Toyota production system equivalent for saving the planet and then act together in concert with the, the mass and the force that they could bring to the market with resources and whatever, and maybe be helpful, which I, this is not a bad fantasy in my head right now. I'm like that, I would, I would go for that. I'd like to help with that. Well, remember, I think I actually proposed that about uh, four weeks ago, uh, that we get a, a collection of, CO, of uh, executives 
to say we've got to stop and we've it means we've got to do this and that and enforcement's going to be the the major problem which turns very authoritarian and unattractive in some ways it does but maybe we have to go there uh, thanks doug i'm carl chair could i just jump in on that quick yes Jill. Um, to the corporate exec thing, there are various consortia of businesses that are inching toward that. And what, for me, one of the favorite examples was, um, well, this must have been the early aughts where um, HP and IBM and I think Dell, some third company, basically dictated to their supply chains what they expected in terms of environmental performance of the products they were supplying. Mm -hmm. And overnight, they had more impact than any stack of regulations out of the EPA. Mm -hmm. had, had global impacts. They said, we're just not going to buy stuff from you unless you adhere to these standards. Right. I mean, that's some of what Doug is talking about. Um, uh, Carl, so, uh, sorry to step in, Carl. Th that's okay, Gil. Uh, notably, Adam Warbach convinced, I think it was Walmart to start buying organic chicken or I, I'm forgetting exactly what the story was. Um, and and over, overnight, I think it might have been McDonald's to to ask for a particular thing with their chickens, no, no more antibiotics, something like that. And overnight, the market for that particular mass commodity shifted because there's they were such huge buyers that well, not quite monopsony, but but close. Uh, Carl, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, on those notes, um, back in the '50s, General Services Administration, who basically buys things at the for the federal government and stuff, we totally Iacocca and company that if you don't buy, if you don't put seatbelts in your cars, we're not buying your vehicles. And that was a transformation. And then there's also, I think the two largest um, supermarkets in Australia said no more plastic bags. And uh, there's data about how much that reduced plastic um, there. Um, I posted a couple links. Um, most people are probably aware of Ray Anderson's work with interface carpet and things. Um, the first link I put was actually uh, an interview that uh, the Public Building Service Commissioner interviewed him back in 2002. And GSA uses uh, interface carpet on, and most hotels use interface carpet ex almost exclusively. Any place you go that's got the carpet tile, um, they uh, invented a new, um, process of like carpet as a service so they they come not only do they come and take the carpet back but they've been pulling out tons of old carpet out of landfills no new oil uh type of thing so um, so that's a part of it and then the other thing that i see he i see him as um going from conservation to restorative the first clip with that interview with uh, was uh, saying there's something beyond sustainability. There's rest being restorative, putting back more than that, that. The goal is putting back more than we take um, when when we can and stuff. And I see that is a that's a whole embrace and extend. Like it's um, leaping over sustainability to this restorative, and then we can pull. We can pull this sustainability wall down um, from the backside, and the end and since um, sustainability means, but sustainability is not enough. Do no more harm is not is not going to get us to where we need to be um, and stuff. So, I mean, we got Thomas Kuhn. Was I mean, he went from, he wrote the book on uh, on. Um, the Copernican revolution in 1957. So he had this mindset that, that, that a paradigm shift required this, this, um, and that things were incommensurable and stuff. Now for that, his mindset of like, um, of like the earth revolves around the sun or the sun revolves around the earth, those are and stuff, but we need to, we need to get past that rip and replace. We're not going to, we're not gonna rip and replace in the next millennium some of the things that we have as momentum and stuff. So we gotta, we gotta find a way. Yeah. So I'll leave it at that for now. Um, uh, hi, yeah. Hey there, it's Ashley with Festival. You, you, you are here. 
Kevin Jones, can you mute, please? I Thank just you. I just muted him. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, although I was really intrigued by what the support call was going to be like. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Ken, please. Yeah, something that um, I think doesn't get um, paid attention to in in these conversations is addiction. Um, when you're addicted to something, it doesn't matter what infidence is presented to you that it's harmful. You know, if you need a fix, you need a fix and you're going to do whatever it takes. You will sell your grandmother's, you know, teeth out of her head to freaking get your fix. And collectively, we are as addicted to oil and energy and economics as any junkie is addicted to heroin. So it presents another layer on top or on or below. I'm not quite sure where that layer is. Um, that is really, really challenging. So, you know, I find this conversation both stimulating and incredibly depressing because, um, you know, we really are looking at, at just how bad things are going to be. And um, yeah, thanks for Kurt Vonnegut. Um, you know, I'm still a Bacon, Bacon fan. Um, but we, I don't think we, we take into account just the, just how strong uh, the people who are, in positions of being billionaires and and the way in which they are completely addicted to their power and their money and their greed they're not going to let go you know it's going to be you can have it when you pry it from my cold dead hands um but by the time your cold dead hands are are available for us to pry something out of it so will mine right. so you know i i just don't know i don't know what to do about that um right. and just one more thing i'll throw in is um from a an mythological standpoint if you search the mythology for giants you'll have a really really hard time finding a single giant that actually is beneficial giants um tend to in mythological terms tend to be they suck up everything they will just they'll go into a land and, and take everything away and leave people with nothing and that's we have a, a giant culture when it comes to economics we're going to roll everything up into general motors and what was it in Huawei? By and large, right? We're going to end up with by and large, and everybody's just going to be floating around. So we have to, a different mythology needs to be evoked somehow to move us out of this um, uh, this conundrum we're in. Um, love that. Um, I mean, I love that philosophically. I hate what you've described, of course. <laughs> it's like, yeah, way, way too accurate. Um, Stuart then, Doug. Yeah, just to pick up on what Ken was saying, I mean, and 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 this is the, this is the, this is the edge, this is the nub, this is the essential piece that we're all looking for. How do we change human be? How do we change human behavior slash? How do we change human thinking, in 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 such a way that the the addiction um, stops? How do we create a new vision? How do we create a new mythology? How do we create a new story, a new earth story. And um, I don't know, maybe we will and maybe we won't, but that's, that's the edge in terms of everyone just realizing that each and every individual living on the planet right now in some way is contributing to the morass we're in. Um, everybody's looking for a solution. Everybody's looking for someone something who has the answer and people don't want to take individual and personal responsibility and, Thanks, and that's, that's the edge yeah agreed um the the new york times op-ed i posted earlier was from a conservative who describes the world from his perspective and it kind of shook me up last night because i didn't agree with all his arguments but boy it, the arguments made a lot of sense as as descriptions of the battle that that's that's raging you know in our country anyway um so uh, doug and then let's get back to our queue uh doug you're muted we are not getting the pleasure of your voice so this um, looks good <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> so so um there, there's an addiction um, to doing us the way we do us. And I'm going to use this, this 
session as a as an example as an exemplar. Um, so the recurring theme, um, pretty much from the beginning, um, has been rooted in sort of focusing on the dark wolf, feeding the dark wolf. So it's the growth medium is fear. And everything that was touched on, invoked, expressed, referenced, inquired into, or contributed to, um, was energetically um, feeding the horror um, of what uh, we're in the middle of, if that's the choice and decision uh, to focus attention. And that's been the in, cognitive, mental focus, abstract focus um, path uh, going back to Newton and Descartes. And um, if we don't do us differently and better, then we're doing us the way we've always done us and we're gonna get what we've always gotten and everything points towards some kind of global extinction or, or you know, ending result for our species. If there's a change to be made or a course correction to be uh, triggered or catalyzed, then um, we're, we're source like we are the creators of everything we're looking at. So uh, as the creators, we got to start with changing us, the way we are doing us, the way we are relating to reality around us. And th that on a lived, modeled, internalized basis, um, is really, really difficult. Like our species may not be up for the task. We may not be evolved enough to do that. But ultimately, ultimately, it's about can we transcend the way we've been doing everything and shift on every dimension and level of our beings to a uh, new uh, us. So our current focus is mental, is intellectual, is abstract. It's, that's the body that's operating. We have four others at our disposal that have been um, basically neglected, rejected, oppressed, or um, ignored in terms of uh, um, our, our physical, um, emotional, spiritual, and energetic dimensions of us. And the question for me, from a present moment, um, no projection into a past and no uh, invocation of a uh, uh, projection to a future rather, or an invocation of past, is what is needed right now? What is the ask? What's the you know, thing that we're looking to replace what is with as the creators of it? I, and somebody earlier sort of alluded to that, like the the, the beginning of a new story to be written is to start in the beginning. Like, what's the it? <laughs> and my, my experience of um, the pulpery of the, of, the, of the grown out of the fear medium and all the challenges and all the problems and all the choices and things that would, could, we, we can focus attention on is sort of a rabbit hole that is keeping us doing us the way we've always done us. But it doesn't map to figuring out what is needed. What do we want from an affirmative, you know, grown out of love, grown out of 
a natural organic reference. You know, and you know, one of the things that popped up, and this is just like a just a spark um, as an example. So in the conversation about carbon, which is this sort of uh, mineral, mineral um, obsessed um, orientation to the world, um, you know, the, the element air in, in ele ancient elemental tradition um, is oxygen and all living things require it. And the thing about air is we breathe it in and our bodies extract just what we need. So we breathe it in and we exhale the air we've taken in minus some oxygen. And we've added to it um, CO2. And that concept of from a natural cycles and flows basis, taking just what we needed, no more, no less, um, is, is what the natural balance of that, those flows and cycles are. If we applied that to our world and the way we relate to it and every living thing on it, um, then uh, it really shifts our orientation our starting premise, our perspective, our whole frame of asking the question what's needed and framing the answer in terms of what do we want? What's the result that we're actually looking for? So I'll stop there, but that's my two cents. Um, Doug, thank you. That was a brainful, and I'm going to take us into a, a minute of silence just so we can ponder what you said. My, my brain was spinning in about a hundred different directions as you were talking. Um, there's a longer conversation to be had, and we don't have that much time for it right now about uh, you, uh, your critique of how we're doing us even here in these calls and in this community, uh, which I would love to dive into. Uh, again, I, uh, we can do it on Mattermost. We can do it next week as a topic for this call. That might be a really good use of our time. Uh, I would love to just open the floor for anybody else who has a thought about what you just said, and then let's go to Wendy. So we make a little, little bit of progress on the queue, which we are not going to be able anywhere nearly to finish today, but I think it's been a really rich conversation. So whoever would like to jump in on what Doug just said, and then after that, we'll go to Wendy. All right, Mr. I thought Frank. it was great. There you go. Um, Gil. Wait, more from Kevin first. More from Kevin first. Kevin, you're you're breakfasting, but still, can you actually it might be lunching because you're in Nashville? Um, do you want to say more? Maybe not. Okay, back to you, Gil. Um, yeah, Doug, thanks very much for that. Uh, um, and so much to say from this whole conversation, but I'll hold it off. But just to what you so gracefully unfolded, um, this is an evolution that I've been going through from. You know, I work with companies and cities around this stuff. Um, and it's been evolution to, from saying you can do less bad and it will be okay for you. Slow down the rate of the damage to stop the damage, to do more good. Um, and more and more, the formulation that I'm speaking about, but also you know, experiencing in myself is what might it be like if we lived and did business and did all the things we do as, as though we actually belonged to the living world. Not trying to treat it better, not trying to harm it less, not trying to manage it better, but as though we belonged to it. 
like sometimes we belong in families and other constellations of human beings where there's a kind of relationship uh, and care and responsibility um, and and this intangible thing called the sense of belonging of where you know where Nora Bateson likes to ask where is the edge of the deer you know where is the edge of me um, you know, do I send food to a refugee relief organization in Africa because I'm compassionate about those people's kids? Or do I do it because that's me and part of me? And that's part of the, I, I think, part of the shift in orientation that some people have been hinting at through this conversation. Um, so I would, yeah, I would, Jerry, I would value having a deeper conversation about that. Um, I have, um, I have, um, concerns about the addiction model that Ken brought into the conversation as the best way to look at this, because I'm not quite sure what that means. And I think we're sort of metaphorizing um, a bunch of things together. And Ken, I'm, you know, I, I, I bow to your much greater experience on this than mine, but that's my, you know, that's how it lands for me. Um, and um, and what I really wanted to talk about when it, when it was Q was about what Kevin said early in the conversation about geezers stepping back. Uh, and I find myself very much in that question as I'm designing an organization that's being initiated by some geezers. Uh, but it feels like what I need to do is step sideways, not back. Um, because there's contributions for the older folks to make in a different capacity, perhaps, rather than withdrawing from the stage. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes, you know, my, where my despair shows up is by saying, well, I'm not going to be here for the worst of it. Uh, and yet uh, that, for some reason in how I'm constituted, that doesn't let me step away from care and concern and responsibility for how the story unfolds. So uh, sharing another time. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Gil. Um, Stacy, I'm sorry, not Stacy, Wendy. Oh my gosh, what, what a rich yeah. conversation <laughs> and thread. I feel like I'm often kind of in at, towards the end of our meetings and, and end up wrapping things together. And I feel like I'm about to kind of do the same thing. I really value the convert, the thread through this about connection. And so I kind of want to go back to that a little bit and, and in part in reaction to what Doug had shared um, about how connection with other people needs to break apart. I think in, in some cases, that's definitely true in order to create what we want, but I'd like to maybe reframe it from my perspective. It's not about getting rid of connection. It's about creating a different kind of connection so that you know we're not, if we're finding that as the old systems that aren't working so well, are breaking apart and that's creating a break in the connections that we currently have, then I am, hypothesizing that the connections that we currently have are not built on um, authenticity and they tend to be built more on what we've achieved together or what knowledge set we share, right? And so a lot of the exploration I've been doing and thought just recently is all kind of old stuff for me, kind of resurfacing around the importance of connection and how we build it and where it comes from and what we can do with it, right? So, um, we are hard, the, the fact is that we're hardwired for connection. So when we start talking about the environment, to me, I think there's a really good argument, not just philosophical, not just spiritual, that is about how we are connected to our environment, not just to each other, but how we're connected to our environment. And I'm thinking now too, I recently watched the, um, the documentary, Kiss the Ground. And if you haven't seen it, it's actually quite inspiring. It's all about the microbiome. It's all about the regenerative agriculture. And I remembered one stat, I'm not gonna get the stat perfectly right. And if somebody wants to find it, post it, that'd be fun. But that really when you're eating food, you're not eating the food, right? The, the bacteria in your stomach is eating the food and you are benefiting from the excretion of those bacteria. Right. So if we're trying to say, I'm not connect, you know, if somebody's walking around in their life going, I'm not really connected with this nature thing. Well, I, 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 yeah. Mm. <laughs> right? It's kind of like, well, you are, whether you realize it or not. So to me, this is an awakening of, or reawakening for some of us of how we truly are connected with each other and with 
the world and with, right? So to me, those are where the richest answers come from. So when we start talking about mitigation, we start talking about solving problems or swooping in and having an answer to something or throwing more money at it. Sure, I think some of those solutions are fabulous. I think the best solutions are gonna be the ones that go back to the bare roots here and are like the mycelium and are like the, you know, the, the fungus that are helping the trees grow, right? We need to get back down to what is it that makes us all thrive. I'm proposing that we remember that one of the biggest things that makes us all thrive is connection. So whenever connection is being restored, then we know we're on the right track. And whenever connection is being dissipated, we know that we're potentially on the wrong track. So I'm going to put in a couple things into chat um, that also speak to some of the things that we've been talking about. Eric Brock, Eric, that, that all have connection woven through. Eric brought up um, how can we use tech to help us be happier and the creative kind of revolution. I really like a video I saw recently by Tristan Harris. I don't think his talk is recent. His talk is about probably like eight years old now, but he talks very clearly about what tech is doing to use the, the neurobiology that we have against us and what we can do to create the tech that uses the neurobiology for us. And while it's about the tech, I would also argue that we all have those choices every day. We just don't usually take agency about them. We let somebody else write the narrative. Then if we write the narrative ourselves, we can take all the things that he highlights and, and do those things more for ourselves, cut out social media in certain ways or different kinds of connections that aren't serving us on tech or off tech. That's the first one. The second one is a fabulous, fabulous, and very well known, taken by millions of people at this point. Lori Santos's Science of Wellbeing free course on Coursera. For those people who are like, oh, what really brings happiness? She breaks it down and talks about this, the myths that we all tell ourselves, what the science really says, and uh, what choices we can make. Again, same along the same lines, but now we're really, instead of a tech focus, we're really talking about uh, well-being and happiness. Then the next one is really great research, you know, grounded in a lot of science. Again, a free, a free um, questionnaire that you can take to find out your character strengths and all the science that's going behind. I mean, and, and we're talking lots of science in, in business, in, pers in uh, personal relationships and life in general and education. If we use our strengths, when we act on our strengths, samples of how to do that, it makes us happier, brings more meaning and purpose into our lives. So again, back to choices of how we connect with what we're doing and how we're doing it. And then the last one is the work um, on the five love languages, which has also been around for a very long time, but is comes more, um, comes from a gentleman who's actually, um, a uh, minister, I believe, and so came from his marriage counseling, but has been around now for so long, it's expanded out to business and it's expanded out to many other places as well and how it's applied. Um, and the five love languages basically say that there's five different ways to connect, that people connect with each other. And inside those five, there's in many different dialects and that understanding what your top love, love languages are and those of people around you create more authentic and uh, deeper connections with each other, fill each other's buckets more easily and more quickly. So understanding your own, you can help fill your own um, and understanding others like children's helps you fill other people's. So all of that to me, those are some of my go-tos all the time and, and things that have been incredibly pivotal over my 20, 30 years of, of, of diving into all these kinds of concepts, I would absolutely love a conversation, a deeper conversation around this. I think it's pivotal and I'm hearing more and more of it just in the last two, three weeks of the shift from talking about how do we collaborate together to how do we create individual personal transformation and recognition that that personal transformation really kind of needs to come first for the collaboration to be successful. Thanks. Can I just say one quick thing? Um, Please. I actually was using the uh, vision and action um, signature strengths when I was teaching positive psychology at San Francisco State. And for those of you who are like me and you take that test, do not go, oh my God, look at number 20. I have to get that back up into my top 10. Go with your top 10 strengths. Yeah, can I, can I just speak about that? It's so interesting. And this goes back to other things you were talking about today. When I've been teaching character strengths too, it is, it's the natural, most people go, oh, look at my weaknesses. So, and I know, you know, Ken, but for other people, the bottom isn't your weakness. 
everyone's got the same. So I started making sure I preempted this thought in people's heads by saying, it's about the amount of energy it takes for you to act on the strength. So you get, can get to the point where your top strengths are so easy for you. You have strengths blindness. You don't even recognize them. You think everyone can do it because it's so easy that actually you get annoyed when other people can't do it because you can't understand why everyone can't, isn't doing this instead of recognizing that this is the thing you actually bring to the room and can offer to other people, right? Versus, and then the other side or something super, super hard. Um, there's a lot of ways to look into how teams work together. You know, the one, lots of times we hire people that have similar strengths to us. And so you have sometimes people on the, as the outliers and then you can get annoyed at them because they're focusing on things that not everybody's, but actually they're the strength of the group because they're the only one focused on those things, it's all those kinds of things uh, um, are incredible. But the most important is the there are no weaknesses. It's about the energy that it takes. Um, that was a tour de force, Wendy. Thank you. Um, just anybody else who has a contribution on that, uh, let's go around for just a moment. If not, uh, well, let's pause. I mean, let's let's uh, wrap the call after that. We didn't make it through, I think, half the room, uh, which is how it goes sometimes, but it was, this is really rich and, and beautiful. I completely appreciate it. Stuart, the floor is yours. Yeah, I just wanted to punctuate uh, the last few um, entries um, because, you know, after talking about more techie things, we got to talk about the human fulcrum. And, and that, I think, is, is, the, is, is the place you know, uh, I remember what, what, who was it? Archimedes who said, it, give me a, give me a fulcrum so long and I can, you know, move the earth or something. Give like me that. a lever and a place to stand and I will move <laughs> the earth. <laughs> Thank you. And, and that's, that's the lever right now. The, the, the human transformation on a massive global scale to just to shift the way people think, you know, picking up on what Doug said, what, what, what Wendy was talking about. These are all the edges. We know so much in this area. There's so much we know, and we know how to move and, and, and shift people by shifting their mind, by changing consciousness. Um, that's the edge. That's the, that's, the, that's the evolution. I've been talking about um, we've conquered outer space. We need to conquer inner space. Uh, and yeah, before we can collaborate and work together, it's the individual transformation that needs to happen. The, the, the capacity just to let go of all the crap that we're living in. And, and, and you know, all of my work in, with conflict, it boils down to creating the context in which people's um, natural empathy and compassion shows up. And it does if you create the right context, ask the right questions and provide the right kinds of education. Um, that's the edge that we're all on right now. And you know, <clears throat> Theodore Sturgeon wrote some, a really interesting uh, science fiction book in the 20s or so that really was about that. And it was that humanity responded collectively to stop a, an alien invasion by gaining collective consciousness and realizing my sacrifice means this, but then it, that happened. It was Is it more than human, Kevin? Yeah, yeah Ke Ke Kevin points to the, the, the key thing. You know, what kind of a catalyzing event is going to just have people kind of wake up on a massive scale? We're not there yet. There, there's not quite enough pain on behalf of enough people, unfortunately. But that's probably what's going to happen. Um, uh, so and, I, I really uh, want to jump in if I can. <laughs> yes, I, I was just going to add that what Stuart just said, Wendy, the things you put in front of us a moment ago are basically like manual instructions for getting to the spot that Stuart just described. So go ahead. Uh, you, I think mm. you've got the last word on the call. Yeah, I just want to add um, one nugget that I forgot to mention before, but it relates exactly to what Stuart was just saying too, and goes back to the idea about the myths that we tell. I think it's really important that we start thinking about who our heroes are and why those people are our heroes. And the thread that I really want to bring out here is generally our heroes are people who have endured suffering, have had shown incredible resilience, and we celebrate that. There's nothing wrong with that. What I'm suggesting though, so we start paying attention to the times when a gentle rise into greater thriving that required no obvious catalytic trauma or crisis 
is also worth celebrating that you end up in the same spot, but one requires a crisis and the other one doesn't, right? And that we generally don't pay attention and don't give credence to the one that didn't have a crisis. So it actually almost encourages the crisis in order for the change to happen. And we start believing that a crisis is necessary for great change. I disagree. I do agree that it happens that way. I disagree that it's the only way to happen. And I would love to see stories that don't have the traditional arc that we have been telling for thousands of years of the reluctant hero who goes on a quest, right? The, the whole journey, hero's journey thing. I think we're ready and ripe for a new story that says that measures, celebrates, and perpetuates um, a general increase in thriving. Thanks. Um, in case nobody knows what the acronym is that I just typed in the chat, it's from your lips to God's ears, Wendy. Um, I think this is a very nice point to suspend this conversation and try to hit resume next time. Uh, Doug, if you want to go on the Mattermost channel and whoever else wants to play to help shape a uh, question for next week's Thursday call, I think that we have a nice nascent topic about how do we do us better. What does that mean? Um, sure, lots... Doug, is off, Doug is off, so I might want to reach out to him directly with that invite. Uh, no, Doug Breitbart, not Doug. Oh, uh, Doug Breitbart, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, and yeah, and, he, and he's it. still here and he's nodding affirmatively. The other Doug. Yes. I think we're good. The Doug Prime. Doug, yes. Doug B and Doug C. Yeah. There you go. Uh, cool. So um, thank you all. It's been like really juicy. My head is going to explode and I've got 40 tabs open to go process. Let's be careful out there. Ciao.